Thanks for tuning in to the Jurassic Park cast, the Jurassic Park podcast with guests chat with me about Michael Crichton's 1990 novel Jurassic Park. And also not that too. A big shout out to Christoph Oaks of Snail, S-N-A-L-E. And a big thank you to him for letting me use his band's music to score this podcast. And you can find his music on Spotify and on Bandcamp. Today's intro is from the song Shelter Dog from Snail's second album, Charlemagne, and our outro is Centipede from Snail's debut album, Snail. Please hear this clip from episode 70, The Inside Man, where I go over the phone lines in Jurassic Park, which I think warrants that we all take a closer look at what Crichton was doing with them. Uh, check this out. All right, in today's episode, we're going to be meeting Dennis Nedry as part of our script review, and I thought, why not look a bit more closely at why Nedry jammed the phone lines, what it means to the story. Spoiler alert, we don't quite know why Nedry jammed the phones, and not being able to call for help becomes a lingering problem for the narrative. Uh, But let's review the texts before we get to my shrugging. (laughs) So why did Nedry jam the phone lines? While Nedry's identity is still kept secret by Crichton, and Dodson is speaking with his mysterious inside man during the chapter airport, Dodson reminds his source, quote, We think the island maintains constant radio contact with InGen corporate headquarters in California, so... And he's interrupted. Look... I got it covered, the man said. Just relax and get the money ready. I want it all Sunday morning in San Jose Airport in cash. On page 71. Apparently, Dodson felt that this constant radio contact with headquarters was a concern, so Nedry took care of it. He jams the phone lines. And even after the park falls and John Arnold has to work overtime to get the systems back up and running, the phones don't come back. Look, Arnold said. The proof is right here, he pointed to the screens. In less than an hour, he said, the park will be back online. The only thing I've got left to clear is the telephones. For some reason, they're still out. But everything else will be working. And that's not theoretical. That's a fact. On page 248. Everything came back online but the phones. And this continues to cause troubles. As Grant enters the sauropod maintenance building, he opens a box and saw a telephone. But when he lifted the receiver, he heard only hissing static. Apparently, the phone lines weren't working yet. On page 251. And Edry is to blame. He's done something that jams the phones good. Wu lifted one phone, heard hissing. Sounds like a modem. But it's not, Arnold said, because I went down into the basement and shut off all the modems. What you're hearing is just white noise that sounds like a modem transmitting. So the phone lines are jammed? Basically, yes. Nedry jammed them very well. He's inserted some kind of a lockout into the program code, and now I can't find it because I gave that restore command which erased part of the program listings. But apparently the command to shut off the phones is still resident in the computer memory. We're told on page 255. So, Dodson was worried about communicating with the mainland, and Nedry was too, so he jammed the phones very well. This impedes our heroes from calling the A and B to have them not deliver Velociraptors to the mainland, but also keeps them from calling for a medevac for Ian Malcolm, who's desperate for proper medical care. So why does Nedry do this? Jamming these phone lines have to have been important to Nedry's heist. Nowhere in the novel does it say why, but we can perhaps deduce that reasonably, should someone have realized that Nedry had stolen the embryos, they would radio the mainland or headquarters and attempt to have someone intercept Dodson's guy, who was on Dodson's boat at the East Dock, where Nedry was going to deliver the embryos, right? In this way, I suppose Nedry was going to have the phone lines jammed the entire weekend until the heist was complete, or something like that. It's not a crazy plan, but on the other hand, when they were complaining about all the phone lines being used, Nedry says, quote, I'll clear a couple for you at the end of the next transmission in about 15 minutes. He yawned. Looks like a long weekend for me. Guess I'll go get that Coke now. And he picked up his shoulder bag and headed for the door. Don't touch my console, okay? Now page 173. In other words, he promised he'd unjam the phones after he commits his heist. I'm not entirely sure what role the jammed phones play in Nedry's scheme, but he's jammed them good. And he, it causes all kinds of troubles for our heroes. Now, once the phone lines are returned, our heroes have one task. That's to call for a doctor to save Malcolm's life. Gennaro, in fact, goes full lawyer, arguing, quote, Look, there's a sick man over in that lodge. He needs a doctor or he'll die. You can't call for a doctor unless you have a phone. Four people have probably died already. Now shut down and get the phones working on page 256. Well, it's just the safety systems don't allow the computer to be shut down. And then turn the goddamn safety systems off. Can't you get it through your head? He's going to die unless he gets help. Full lawyer. Good for Gennaro. They turn the systems off and they get the phones back. But they don't come back immediately. But come back they do. So Gennaro picks up the phone and, quote, started to dial when he suddenly stopped. Uh-oh. <laughs> Jesus, look at that, he said. And he pointed to one of the video monitors, but Arnold wasn't listening. He was staring at the map, where a tight cluster of dots by the lagoon had started to move in a coordinated way, moving fast in a kind of swirl. What's happening, Gennaro said. The duckbills, Arnold said tonelessly. They stampeded on page 258. Oh, Gennaro, you forgot you were phoning for a doctor. I guess Malcolm can wait. So 
All that happens in the chapter Dawn, which begins at 5 a.m. Uh, at dawn. They dump the system and restore manually. This is when they revert to backup power, which becomes a big problem in the novel, you'll recall. The phones are back shortly after 5 a.m. after the reset. By 8 a.m., we're at the chapter Aviary. John Arnold is using the phones, and he's commuting, communicating with Malcolm. <laughs> and he's phoned, he's phoned him into the... Uh, where I guess Malcolm's in the lodge. And he's, he's saying that they can't find Grant and the kids with the motion sensors of the video cameras yet on page 276. More importantly, even though Gennaro forgot to call for a doctor, Arnold has now done it for him. Quote, all the park systems are back and functioning correctly. The phones are working. I've called for a doctor for you, says Arnold. Arnold's speaking over the phone to Malcolm. So, Dateline, Jurassic Park. We can confirm on page 276 at 8 a.m. Arnold tells Malcolm that he has called for a doctor. But a doctor does not arrive until sundown. By page 369, in the chapter Under Control, it says, quote, four hours had passed after they'd stopped the ship from reaching the mainland, which was uh, conclusively just a desperate breath away from 11 a.m. when the ship was going to reach Punta Arena. So that makes this like 3 or 3.30 p.m., something like that. Quote, they had called authorities in San Jose for help. The Costa Rican National Guard was on its way, as well as an air ambulance to carry Malcolm to a hospital. But over the telephone, the Costa Rican Guard had been distinctly cautious. Undoubtedly, calls would go back and forth between San Jose and Washington before help was finally sent to the island, and now it was growing late in the day. If the helicopters did not arrive soon, they would have to wait until morning, we're told on page 369. So, they phoned at 8 a.m., and we know it's a 40-minute trip, as Hammond says on page 76, and we know from prologue, Bite of the Raptor engine has helicopters that fly, quote, sick workers uh, back and forth to, uh, you know, when there's, when there's problems. It's just crazy. If Malcolm were as injured as he is, then an emergency vehicle wouldn't have been quicker to arrive. If anything, I would guess this is just a casualty of Creighton's imagination. He schemed up this telephone line issue that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it adds some drama to the story, which is great because we like the drama in the story. We think the story is good. And then the resolution of the phone issue just seems to result in some wonky narrative stuff, but that's okay. That's the tale of the telephones. Not Creighton's greatest achievement in the novel, but an interesting one to look at more closely. So what do you think? Did I miss something? Uh, this was simplified in the movie. Lexington get the phone lines working when they restore power, and Grant calls Hammond with the good news before they're chased from the control room by the Velociraptors. But other than that, uh, it's very simple in the, in the film. In the novel, though, the phone lines <laughs> get a, a, a twisted tale in a way. All right, a big thanks to you for tuning in. If you're interested in more of the podcast, you can find it wherever podcasts are, and just look for Jurassic Park Cast. Include those hyphens or Jurassic Park Podcast. That might work too. Uh, and you know, if you like the videos, you can like and subscribe and receive notifications when a new one is available. There is a lot more to come. Until next time.